Canadian Broadway star Nick Cordero was in intensive care for about three weeks with COVID-19. Then, doctors had to amputate the 41-year-old's right leg. Blood clots had caused irreversible damage. The case shows that coronavirus is more than just a lung infection. Intensive care medics from China, North America and Europe are seeing more and more thromboses. These blood clots are not just dangerous for patients' limbs. They can break away and affect the lungs, the heart or the brain in the form of pulmonary embolisms, heart attacks or strokes. A research team at New York's Irving Medical Center says it has never seen so many extreme, abnormal cases. From the first known instance of COVID-19 nearly half a year ago in the Chinese city of Wuhan, medical scientists are still learning all the ways the virus can cause harm. I'm Rob Watts in Berlin. It's good to have you with us. At their worst, they can cause heart attacks and strokes. Blood clots are becoming a common complication with COVID-19 cases. Scientists are trying to understand why. Specialists at Hamburg's Forensic Medicine Institute are examining the bodies of diseased coronavirus patients for clues. Cause of death, coronavirus. Hamburg's Forensic Medicine Institute has been in high gear since the outbreak of the pandemic. Institute director Klaus Puschel and his team have performed almost 200 autopsies on COVID-19 victims, more than any other German state. At first, disease control agency the Robert Koch Institute advised against the exams, saying it would endanger medical scientists, something Puschel pushed back against. We know that aerosols are dangerous. That's why we have special exhaust systems and we wear protective clothing. It's a matter of course for a pathologist or a forensic medical scientist. We ask Professor Puschel if we may film during an autopsy. A clinic camera team captures footage through the window. Puschel says the researchers learn more each day. For example, that many of the deceased had a unique type of pneumonia with tissue bleeding, that victims' brains were almost always altered by inflammation, and that coronavirus was found on eye tissue. We took samples of almost every tissue in all these cases. We're trying to comprehend what happens in the muscles or inside the liver. In the weeks and months ahead, many more results will be recorded, which will greatly expand our understanding of this disease. The scientists screen all of the bodies and take CT scans. In a new study, they say that thromboses and pulmonary embolisms were frequently found in the deceased, something intensive care medics have already suspected. This finding has direct implications for future treatment. This has changed the guidelines, especially in the way that the blood clotting system and the formation of thromboses are specifically in focus and more intensive precautions are being taken so that thromboses and embolisms don't form. The high number of autopsies confirms earlier results. On average, the victims were 80 years old and most of them were men. All of them had severe pre-existing conditions, such as high blood pressure, heart attacks or organ damage. Well, we can now speak to Professor Clemens Ventner. He's an expert in infectious diseases from Munich's Schwabing Hospital and the first doctor to treat coronavirus patients in Germany. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you just explain, in simple terms if possible, the relationship between blood clots and coronavirus? So we know that uh, coronavirus can induce uh, some inflammation. Uh, not only in the lungs, but also in the blood vessels. There are specific receptors even in the inner side of these vessels. We call them uh, endothelium. And uh, we have uh, done recent research showing us that uh, this inflammation in the endothelium can activate platelets, so thrombocytes. 
And by activation of uh, platelets, you get, uh, you know, clumps in the blood. Uh, we call it uh, microemboli. And so these things then can just uh, stop the blood uh, from flowing. And uh, this can be a pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis. Or in the lung, we also might have uh, real severe problems that parts of the lung are not perfused anymore. There have also been reports of clusters of younger COVID-19 patients suffering strokes. Is that likely related to some sort of clotting resulting from the virus? Um, that's, uh, that's our thinking at this point, that this is in line with this uh, clotting um, disorder de defect in COVID-19. So also the brain is supported by many vessels and uh, there are some hints that a big uh, vessels uh, just perfusing the brain also have these changes uh, in the inner walls. Uh, so um, the endothelium is infected, you know, and by this clots just uh, are shut in the brain and uh, this is then the clinical sign of a stroke for the patient. I mentioned at the start that you treated the first coronavirus patients here in Germany. Has your understanding of the disease drastically changed since then, to the point where you would perhaps treat them differently? Yeah, in the beginning, uh, we just thought it's just a simple virus infection like uh, the flu. Um, meanwhile, we have learned during the last uh, weeks um, and also, you know, months here in Germany, that uh, the major problem with COVID-19 is the, we call it a hyperinflammation. So this kind of uh, inflammation as a secondary event in COVID-19. So this tells us that besides, you know, applying heparin uh, very liberally to our patients, also drugs blocking this inflammation, um, like, it's an IS-6 receptor antagonist, a very complicated word. It's an, uh, it's an antibody, it's called tocilizumab. This antibody, for example, we have some hope that uh, this inflammation can be blocked, but there are other drugs. And this is, I think, a change in our, in our way we treat uh, our COVID-19 patients nowadays. Well, thank you very much for your time. Professor Clemens Bentner from Munich's Schwabing Hospital. Thank you very much indeed. And now it's your chance to ask the questions. Our science call. How long do microscopic droplets containing SARS-CoV-2 remain in the air? I touched on this question once a few weeks ago, but it's time to answer it again as we now have more data on whether or not SARS-CoV-2 might be what's often called airborne. Um, we know the virus is transmitted by larger droplets that come out when you sneeze or cough, but what about the tiny droplets called aerosols that you emit all the time when you speak? Could they also transmit the infection? A new study indicates that they might. Um, using extremely sensitive lasers, the researchers tracked aerosols emitted by test subjects speaking and detected at least a thousand tiny droplets a minute that if those people had been infected, could possibly have contained virus. And those droplets remain floating in the air for 8 to 14 minutes. Um, we don't know how many viruses it takes to make someone sick, but the work says at least in enclosed spaces, probabilities are high that infected people could transmit the virus simply by speaking loud. Um, the testing was done in the lab, of course, and not under real-world air circulation conditions, so there are some caveats, but this study, I think, is likely to have an impact on health policy. How long does the virus last on your clothes? A well-known study from last March found the coronavirus was detectable for up to 24 hours on cardboard, which in terms of its absorbent qualities, is similar to many types of textiles. Um, 
Most experts I read are therefore taking 24 hours as a ballpark figure for clothing as well. But um, before you start stuffing your entire wardrobe in the washing machine, you should know those tests were done with pretty high virus concentrations in the lab. Um, in the real world, you're unlikely to be exposed to those kinds of levels. So in general, the experts say you shouldn't worry too much about your clothing providing a path for infection. Could COVID-19 be linked to the collection of bat guano used as fertilizer? I love this question because it took me by surprise. I'd, I'd never thought about it as a possibility. Bat guano, the animal's dried feces, is widely used as a fertilizer in Asia and, and other parts of the world. And it's also an ingredient in some traditional Chinese medicines. And large-scale studies in the past have isolated hundreds of different coronaviruses from, from bat droppings. So could the first infections in this pandemic possibly be linked to the guano trade? Doesn't seem like a completely unreasonable speculation to me, but there's, there's no clear evidence for it. And without that, it's just one speculation among many. Our science correspondent, Derek Williams, there. And finally, a new disease calls for new ways of teaching how to treat it. And at least one method gets extra points for following social distancing guidelines. Have a look at this. Doctors in Taiwan are using virtual reality to learn how to handle COVID-19. Equipped with goggles and control sticks, they're able to test skills and learn from mistakes without risking their own health or without a teacher physically present. Here's a trainee practicing how to take a medical sample from the virtual patient's throat. <laughs> 